Well, Goethe, it's time to finish what we started. Faust, part two. So as I believe I mentioned before, part two of Faust actually was written somewhat later than part one. Goethe took a long time to finish this story, like 60 years to write the whole thing. And in fact, it's the very last thing he finished right before he died. And I know you want to find out what happens to Faust at the very end of the play. Does he go to hell? Does he go to heaven? Does Mephistopheles win the bet? Does the Lord? But first, we've got five acts of crazy to get through. I'm going to summarize each act fairly quickly, spend a little bit more time at the very end of the play. Before we dance on through part two of Faust, it might be good to explore a couple of key ideas that help us to understand what's going on in part two. First of all, it's important to notice that some of Goethe's interests have shifted since part one. He started exploring a lot of these sort of Germanic myths and legends, the whole Walpurgis Night thing. Well, in this section, he's going to be much more interested in classical literature. That is, literature that pertains to the Greek and Roman traditions and mythologies. We're going to have another Walpurgis Night, but it's going to be set in classical tradition. It is a classical Walpurgis Night, and it will be um, in the midst of Greek myth. A second significant change from part one to part two is that Goethe's interest in the plight of Faust as an individual is shifted somewhat to a lot of interest in society, in government, in politics. There's a lot about community and the way we work together in part two. Finally, part two is structured very heavily on the concept of alchemy. If you remember, alchemy is that medieval pseudoscience where you're trying to combine disparate elements and forge them into some sort of paradoxical unity. So we're taking all the elements that are opposite and combining them in order to make something new. If we combine them just correctly, we'll ultimately achieve the Philosopher's Stone. There are two goals often cited in alchemy. The first one is to take base metals and turn them into gold. Uh, the second, though, is to combine all elements into a perfect unity, which creates the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone could give immortality. You're probably familiar with it through Harry Potter. In any case, there are five elements. The first four are the earthly elements, and the fifth is the heavenly element. They are fire, water, wind, and earth. And they're in opposing pairs. Fire and water are opposing pairs, and if you could combine them and still retain their essence, making a paradoxical unity, imagine what would come from that. And earth and air, which seem to be in opposition as well, if you could combine that, and then combine all four into one unified whole, you'd achieve the Philosopher's Stone, or the fifth element like in the movie. The fifth element is the ether. It's the uh, heavenly essence. It is the ultimate culmination of things that creates the Philosopher's Stone. I owe much of my understanding of this to the wonderful notes on the website of Professor Bruce McLennan from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He has excellent notes over part two of Faust. I'm going to link them in my description below. You should definitely check them out. He's going to go in much more in depth than I am. But he pointed out to me the fact that each of the acts follows one of these five elements. So act one is fire. Act two is water, act three is air, and act four is earth, finally leading to the distillation of them all in act five, where Faust becomes heavenly. It might help us to understand why Faust gets where he does in the end. In any case, here's a quick summary of the five acts. Act one, Faust is lying out in nature surrounded by fairies who ease his suffering and his pain after the loss of Gretchen and sort of help him to move on and forget. Shift scene to the Emperor's throne room where the Emperor is having some monetary problems and trying to figure them out. Mephistopheles as a jester and Faust as a courtier arrive and they come up with a solution to fix the Emperor's economic problems, and that is to print paper money. They go on to have a wild celebration. So in the midst of their Mardi Gras celebration, Faust makes a promise to the Emperor that he will bring some really great entertainment by conjuring up Helen of Troy and Paris from the myth. However, this is really complicated, and Mephistopheles realizes that it's beyond his power. He gives Faust instructions how to do that, but Faust has to descend into this strange place with these figures called the Mothers, and then return with some way to bring Helen and Paris back. It's complicated. But he succeeds in the end at great risk to himself, and there, in the midst of the hall, he displays Helen and Paris. But when he sees Helen, the ideal beauty, he is overwhelmed by her and reaches out to touch her. But she's really just a vision, and therefore he can't grab onto her, and so the whole vision explodes. 
End of Act 1. Act 2! Mephistopheles brings Faust home. And there they meet up with that same student that Mephistopheles was messing with way back at the beginning of the book. He's a graduate now. Wagner, meanwhile, is working on an interesting project where he's trying to create life. He's trying to bring to life this homunculus, which is again kind of an alchemical idea. It's the attempt to create a being that comes to life that isn't just born. The homunculus does come to life, but it's more thanks to Mephistopheles than Wagner, and then it decides to go with Mephistopheles and Faust on their quest into the classical Walpurgis Night. Because you see, it's incomplete. It doesn't really have a self. It's kind of a disembodied essence in a jar at the moment. Also, Faust, who was unconscious this whole time, was dreaming of Leda and the Swan, which is a myth about the birth of Helen and how Zeus um, chases after this woman named Leda, transforms himself into a swan so that he can capture her and uh, take advantage of her and produces the baby Helen. Faust still has Helen on the brain, and so he decides to go in quest of this woman, this ideal beauty from all of mythology, and he's going to have to go to classical Walpurgis Night in order to find her. So, ditching Wagner once again, Faust, Mephistopheles, and the homunculus head off to classical Walpurgis Night. There, things go crazy, and it takes the rest of Act 2 to get out of Walpurgis Night. You remember what Walpurgis Night was like before, right? Yeah. Interestingly, the three split up. The homunculus is looking for his self, and he's looking for these ancient philosophers who can teach him how to, to be, how to exist. Faust is, of course, seeking ideal beauty in Helen. And Mephistopheles is kind of wandering around lost, but he is pursuing sort of sensual pleasure. He's chasing after these ladies who are enticing and seducing him, but leading him astray. It's interesting to note here that Mephistopheles is very out of his element. He's no longer in control of the situation. He was sort of master in Walpurgis Night, but here, in the classical world, he has no influence. Faust finds some help in Chiron, the old centaur who helped the heroes of old in mythology, and he rides on Chiron as they go to look for Helen. We have Seismos who shakes up the whole thing. We have this giant volcano and this big discussion of how the Earth is created through volcanic material. Then, Mephistopheles discovers the Forciads, these hideously ugly women with one eye and one tooth. It seems that as Faust is seeking after ideal beauty, Mephistopheles seems to have discovered and become enamored with ideal ugliness. He in fact transforms himself into one of the Forciads, and he's ugly too. The homunculus goes on and meets all these sea spirits down by the Aegean Sea, ultimately meeting Proteus. And there the homunculus seems to sacrifice himself in this sort of unifying act of fire and water. Goodbye, homunculus. And that's the end of Act 2. What does the homunculus' sacrifice mean for us? I don't know! It might be the moment that frees Helen. Or it might just be another destructive moment in this book, like the death of Gretchen's child. Or it may just explore the idea of the sacrifice of the self for something bigger and more universal. Anyway, Act 3! We open with Helen, who's returned home to Menelaus's house after the Trojan War, except for she's sort of vague on everything. There she finds everything kind of how she left it, except for it's kind of weird. She kind of feels like she still might be a myth. What really happened? And there she also finds this hideously ugly woman with one eye and one tooth. Hey look, it's Mephistopheles, as Forceus. And Menelaus is coming home and he seems to want to maybe sacrifice Helen? Mm. And so she runs off with Forceus slash Mephistopheles to this man that Forceus says will protect her. Guess who it is? It's Faust. Faust greets her in this big sort of courtly love way. He also kind of condemns the Watchman who was so overwhelmed by the beauty of Helen when she arrived that he forgot to, you know, announce her presence. But Helen pardons him. His name is Lincius and he shows up through the rest of the play singing songs. He has an important part in Act 5. Anyway, Faust and Helen hook up and they're all happy until Menelaus' army starts marching to meet them and to overwhelm Faust. And Faust says, you know what? Forget the politics here. I'm running off with Helen. You all fight this battle for me. And so Faust and Helen run off to be protected by Forceus slash Mephistopheles. And there they have a baby whose name is Euphorion. So yeah, they had a baby, that's weird. And Euphorion is this airy creature who likes to leap and bound and jump. And Faust keeps telling him to be grounded in Earth. So again, we have the dichotomy of the Earth and the air. Euphorion. Now let me leap skyward and higher. Now let me skip. Buoyant desire takes me already into its grip. Faust. But steady, steady, not danger courting, least heedless sporting bring fall and ruin, our dearest son be our undoing. And finally, after bouncing around for quite some time, Euphorion decides he's going to fly. And he says, still, and already pinions unfold. <laughs> Thither, I must, I must, grant me the flight. And he leaps off this cliff, and he kind of floats for a second, and then he falls to his death. And his body vanishes, leaving only his clothes. 
Helen also says, well, my time to check out. Now that my son's dead, I guess I'll return to the underworld. Bye bye Faust, Mwah! and she's gone too. Okay, strange. Forcius slash Mephistopheles tells Faust to cling onto her clothes so they don't get snatched down to Hades. And as Faust clings to her clothes, they turn into clouds and he flies away. And Forcius pulls off her mask to reveal, hey, it's still Mephistopheles. Was it all a vision? Was it all a masquerade? It's over now. <sighs> On to act four. So Faust and Mephistopheles return to the Empire, whose economic situation they had meddled with. And it seems that paper money has caused different things to happen. Now the Emperor is in trouble, and there's another opposing army coming to meet him and trying to take over his kingdom. Mephistopheles says he'll help, and he conjures up these three giant monsters. Their names are Pugnacious, Rapacious, and Tenacious. They lead the army, and over and over the Emperor and the Commander-in-Chief keep saying, wait, wait, wait. Are we using devil's work here? And they're like, no, 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 it's okay. It's good magic, I promise. Well, they win, thanks to Mephistopheles and his demonic magic. At the end of the battle, after their victory, Faust asks for some Oceanside property because he has a special project in mind, which is going to take up Act 5. And the Emperor grants him that, thanks to his help. And then we finally see this little debate about church and state and the way the church seems to be taking a lot more than it ought to. Dante would appreciate this conversation. And that brings us to Act 5, which is the exploration of the end of Faust's life and the part I want to spend the most time with. Act 5, we introduce a little hut with two old people living there named Bossus and Philemon. This used to be a seaside hut, but something has happened. A wayfarer, who was once saved by the old couple, stops by to see them again one more time, and they greet him and welcome him in warmly. This is connected with a particular myth of an old couple who showed kindness when they were visited by Zeus, and therefore were blessed with a wish. They wished to die together so that they would never have to be apart, and to always be able to stay in their ancestral land. This little couple used to be on the side of the sea, but then the sea moved backwards. You see, Faust has had this project to move the ocean. He's opened up this brand new section of land by building these dikes and these sort of systems to push back the ocean. And he's opened this huge area, making his own little empire. It seems like he's building something innovative and new, and it's all kinds of cool, except for this old couple notices that in the middle of the night, there are these like inhuman screams and there's these dark fires that happen and all of a sudden, ding, there's a dike. It's Mephistopheles working with hellish magic in order to make all of this work for Faust. As the act goes on, we discover that Faust is really enjoying his new kingdom with one significant thorn in his flesh. There's this one little plot of land that he thinks he ought to own and in order to make this entire kingdom his, but it's owned by this little couple. They're sweet, but they're in his way. He's offered and offered for them to move to this new location, but they don't trust this land that's been opened up where the sea used to be. They prefer to stay high and dry. Mephistopheles offers a solution. He and his three big friends that helped them win the battle in the last scene will go and forcibly move the couple to a place where they'll be better off in Faust's mind. Faust agrees, thinking it's for the best. Remember Lincius? Well, he's still up in the tower watching over everything as he has been really for a long time and singing these songs about nature and such. And then he begins to see this fire pluming up from the distance in the little sweet homestead of that nice little couple. Oh, it turns out that Mephistopheles with his three big brutes has gone over there and killed them all and burned the place down. Now he says it was an accident. The old people died of fright when they saw the giants and uh, the young visitor that they had, you know, attack them. And so they just you know, had to defend themselves and kill him. And then a fire accidentally started and everything just got burned down. Faust is upset because he wanted to take that place for himself and he also wanted to do it in a kind of just and fair way. He wanted to give them compensation for it, but he never got the chance to. Instead, he just crushed them, killed them, and took what was theirs. There's a reference to Nabal's vineyard in here and uh, Nabal was this nice little vineyard guy who has had this nice little vineyard in the Bible, and there was an evil king named Ahab, one of the worst of the kings, who saw that vineyard, desired it for himself, and he and his wife Jezebel sort of worked everything out so that Nabal would be killed and they would get the vineyard. In other words, although Faust seems to be trying to build this perfect empire in this new land that he's created by pushing back the sea, He's doing it through really rotten methods because he's still using Mephistopheles. In the middle of the night, these phantasmagoric creatures come to his door and seek to visit him. They are want, debt, care, and need. 
Want, Debt, and Need can't get in because he's rich now, but Care manages to slip through the keyhole and haunt him. Faust tries to stave off Care, but ultimately, Care blows in his eyes and blinds him. He is, by the way, in this act, a really, really old man. A lot of time has gone by in creating this kingdom. And so then he stands up and he leaves his house. Meanwhile, outside, Mephistopheles has his demon skeleton creatures digging holes for him. Normally, these are the creatures that build those dikes and have pushed back the ocean, but at this point, he's digging a hole, a perfect human-sized hole. Guess who for? And Faust, walking blindly through this area, hears the digging of spades, and he thinks that his kingdom is continuing to grow, and he begins to talk about this kingdom that he's constructed and what he intends for it. Mephistopheles overhears him and points out slyly that even though Faust has pushed back the ocean and has reclaimed this land, the land is continually degenerating and going back to sea. It's turning swampy. It has to be kept at constantly in order to keep it a fertile land. Faust envisions it as this perfect community where people will work hard in order to keep things going and everyone will be happy. A chain of marshes lines the hills, befouling all the land's retrievement. To drain this stagnant pool of ills would be the crowning last achievement. I had open room to live for millions, not safely, but in free resilience. Lush fallow then to men and cattle yield, swift crop and comfort from the maiden fields, new homesteads near the trusty buttress face, walled by a bold and horny-handed race. In an, a land of Eden sheltered here within, let tempest rage outside into the rim, and as it laps a breach in greedy riot, communal spirit hastens to defy it. Yes, this I hold to with devout insistence. Wisdom's last verdict goes to say, he only earns both freedom and existence, who must reconquer them each day. And so he talks about this community where they'll be constantly working to reconquer their freedom, constantly earning what they receive. And that final clearing of this land, the final consummation of this kingdom, will be his crowning achievement, he thinks. So ringed all about by perils, here youth, manhood, age will spend their strenuous year. Such teeming would I see upon this land, on acres free among free people stand. I might entreat the fleeting minute, O oh, tarry yet, thou art so fair. My path on earth, the trace I leave within it, eons untold cannot impair. For tasting such high happiness to come, I savor now my strivings crown and sum. And so he imagines in that moment when he finally sees his kingdom complete and all the land is drained of these marshes and the people living there working and free, he will see that moment and he will feel satisfaction and he'll say, ah, oh, tarry to the moment, just as he said he would back at the beginning in his deal with Mephistopheles. When he calls out and says, I'm content, let this moment last, let this moment linger, that's when he can die. Well, is he at that moment? Difficult to say, because he's talking about that moment, but it's still in the future, right? It's at the completion of his project, which is not yet complete. But is the anticipation of its completion satisfaction enough? Anyway, Mephistopheles thinks so, and Faust dies in that moment, and there he's dropped into his grave. We get this wonderfully weird scene in which Mephistopheles camps out over the tomb waiting for Faust's soul to emerge from his body, and he conjures up all these devils from all angles to make sure they watch every possible way, don't let Faust's soul escape. And just in that moment, this army of angels starts marching forward, and they're throwing these roses at them, and the roses are overwhelming the devils. And so Mephistopheles says, quick, blow the roses away. But as the devils blow on the roses, the roses burst into flame, scaring away all the devils, leaving only Mephistopheles to guard his prey. And then the roses have a particular effect on Mephistopheles. And so all of these roses begin to stick to Mephistopheles because these roses symbolize love. They're throwing love. And the love is chasing away the demons. And then rather comically, as these roses stick to Mephistopheles and he's trying to like get all them off and get away from them, he starts feeling like all these happy, warm sentiments. And he's like, those angels, my enemies, they're not really so bad. In fact, they're kind of attractive. And he starts like flirting with them as they slip in and steal Faust's soul away from him. And so then he finally gets control of himself and starts throwing off the roses and shouting and cursing, but it's too late. The angels have Faust's soul. And Mephistopheles shouts back that they're just devils anyway. How can this be? Where are they gone away? You half-baked tribe, you have made off with it. To heaven, they are spiriting my prey. That's why they came to buzz about this pit. I have been robbed of costly, peerless profit. The lofty soul pledged me by solemn forfeit. They've spirited it slyly from my writ. 
Where do I sue now as complainer? Who will enforce my well-earned right? You have been fairly cheated, old campaigner. You have deserved it, grim enough your plight. This thing was wretchedly mishandled. A great expense for shame is thrown away. A vulgar lust, absorbed amours have dandled the seasoned devil of his prey. If to this childish, fatuous spree one so experienced could descend, then no mean folly it must be that seized upon him in the end. Exunt Mephistopheles. And so in the final moments, Mephistopheles loses. The love flowers kind of keep him busy while the angels steal away Faust's soul. The final scene is Faust's soul ascending into heaven. And it kind of mirrors Dante's Paradiso, which I'm also talking about in another set of videos. He travels up and sees all these sort of figures as he's getting higher and higher in heaven. And they talk about his continual transformation as he leaves behind his body and becomes lighter and more ethereal the perfection of him as the ethereal element. He's presented before the Virgin Mary by all of these penitent women. And as they sing and present him, he is purified. And among these penitent women, there is one who is Gretchen. And she pleads specifically to Mary for him. Using some similar language to the prayer she said to the statue of the Virgin Mary earlier on when she was in great danger. Incline thou past comparing, thou radiance bearing thy grace upon my happiness. The early cherished, no longer blemished, returns to bliss. Now that she's perfected, she's now happy. Instead of pleading in her sorrow, she's pleading in her bliss. And she's pleading for the soul of Faust. And she is able to do the, be the final guide to Faust in as she pleads for his soul. And he arrives and hears the chorus mysticus. And so finally we have the perfecting of all things in Faust. Now the question is, what in the final moments actually saves Faust? And I'm not sure it's abundantly clear. Some people argue that because his final vision was very selfless, after all, he's trying to build this community for the people and for others and for the community instead of being completely self-absorbed in his moment of satisfaction, that's what actually makes him better and saves him. Others say that perhaps it's that saves him in the first place because after all, it's she who pleads for him at the very end. And it also seems like love in the form of the roses is what conquers Mephistopheles, not necessarily anything particularly good that Faust himself did. And it does seem like Mephistopheles is kind of tricked out of it without any real solid reason. Maybe that final moment of toil that Faust was working on, that empire that he's trying to build by pushing back the sea is something great enough to overcome the wiles of the devil. It is interesting that the action he was trying to do connects us back to the book of Job. Remember how we started by talking about the book of Job? Remember how the first couple chapters of the book of Job sort of sets up the format for the beginning of Faust? God and the devil having a conversation and making a bet about a soul? In the book of Job, the Lord and Satan make a bet over Job's soul. And in the book of Faust, the Lord and Mephistopheles make a bet over Faust's soul. Well, Job, towards the end of Job, talks about the power of God and the greatness of God, the fact that there is no one on earth who can hold back the sea. Yet, Faust manages to do that, at least in part. Although that work may be impermanent, Faust does drive back the sea for a while and creates his own kingdom there. Does this god-like arrival kind of mirror Faust's goal from the beginning? Does he truly fulfill his potential as the Lord expected him to do in the prologue? I'll leave that up to you to figure out. In any case, our work is now done. We've journeyed with Faust all the way from the beginning to the end. Thanks so much for watching. Click here to watch previous episodes or click here to subscribe. If you'd like to watch some other literary episodes, I suggest you try to watch the videos over Dante's Inferno. You can click right here to watch those. And I'll see you later. Since the second half of Faust is the forgettable half, let's choose a Disney song from a movie that is largely forgotten because it's terrible. Zippity doo da, zippity day. My oh my, going to heaven today. Gretchen will save me any old day. Zippity doo da, zippity day.